All right, everybody, welcome to unit four uh, with probability. So um, in unit four, we're going to, this section, we're just gonna do an introduction to probability. So this is kind of exciting. It's not quite as a vocabulary heavy section as the last two chapters were. So this will be a little bit more mathy than your last two chapters. Um, but I would just highly suggest as you're working through chapter four to do as many practice problems as possible. Honestly, the more practice problems that you do, the better you get at these questions and the better you understand where to start, what formulas to use, what the question is asking you, what information it's given. And the honestly, the only way to do that is through practice. There's lots of practice problems underneath each section. So if you want to take some time after you watch the video to try some of those, I would highly suggest doing that for this section. All right, so what we're going to do in this section is we're going to describe a probability model. So that is a vocab word. You'll have to understand exactly what that means. Use basic probability rules. And actually, a lot of what you'll see here is what you will potentially have already done in Algebra 2. Um, understand how to use a two-way um, table and a Venn diagram to model a chance process. And then use the general addition rule to calculate probabilities. All right, so let's just um, take a few reminders from Unit three that we had previously. So remember our law of large numbers. So remember that the law of large numbers tells us the probability of any given event is that the outcome will approach a single number over time. So if you repeat the process many, 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 many times, then the probability will approach a single number. So basically, if I flip a coin a gazillion times, the probability of getting heads or tails is both 50%. So in section 3.4, we use simulations to imitate chance behavior. However, we don't always have to rely on simulations to determine the probability of a particular event. So what we're gonna do um, is we are gonna develop a model for chance behavior on the next couple of slides. So when we say develop a model for chance behavior, that's basically just going to say, what are the possible outcomes for the situation that I'm given, and what are the probabilities for each of those given situations? All right, so let's just think about tossing a coin. When you toss a coin, you don't know if it's going to land on heads or tails. However, you do know that when you toss it, you either get heads or tails. The probability of each occurring is 50%. All right, so remember that 50% is the long run probability. If I flip it a gazillion times, then 50% of the time I'll get tails, 50% of the time I'll get heads. All right, so there's two important concepts. Those two important concepts are this. First of all, what does it look like if we toss the coin one time? That is called our sample space. What physically could happen if I toss the coin one time? I could get heads or I could get tails. So the sample space is what could happen. So in this case, there's two possibilities, heads or tails. The other thing we're gonna take a look is the probability of each outcome. So sample space, what can happen? What's the probability for each piece in the sample space? So in this case, the probability of getting heads is 50%, the probability of getting tails is 50%. So the sample space is the set of all possible outcomes. Toss a coin once, heads or tails. Basically, if you toss a coin, what are the possibilities that you would get? A probability model, so this is a vocab word you'll have to understand, is a description of a chance process. So what does it look like when you toss a coin one time? It is both parts. The probability model includes both the sample space and the probability for each outcome within the sample space. So let's see what this looks like getting a little bit more complicated. So let's say we roll two fair six-sided dice, one that's red and one that's yellow yellow. What does the probability model look like for this chance process? So just remember when we say probability model, that means what is the actual, what are all the possibilities when I roll two die, okay, and the probability of each event occurring. So notice I could roll a one on the first die and then all the possibilities on the second die. I could roll one, two, three, four, five, six. I could roll two on the second die or the first die, and the second die could roll one, two, three, four, five, six. I could roll three on the first die, and then one, two, three, four, five, six on the second die. So these are all of the possible combinations that when I roll a die, two times that I will get. Okay, so my sample space is 36 outcomes. Now, since the dice are fair, 
each outcome is equally likely. So remember that the probability is going to be the outcome of each event occurring. So this, this event occurring, this event occurring, this event occurring, this event occurring. Since they're all equally likely, each outcome has a probability of 1 out of 36. So this is my sample space, and this is the probability. Together, those are called your probability model. All right, so let's take a look at something different. Suppose we have a box that has four red, two blue, and one white marbles. We're going to draw a tree diagram that represents the sample space, all right, if we draw two marbles without replacement. So that means we're drawing one, we're keeping it, and then we're drawing a second one. So think about for a second, on this first column, that's going to represent what are the possibilities that I could have when I draw the first marble out of the bag or the box, okay? So my first draw, when I draw it out, I could get red, I could get blue, or I could get white. Now the probability model says, okay, number one, I have to give the sample space and the probability. What is the probability I get red? Well, there's four out of a total of seven. There's two out of a total of seven for blue and one out of a total of seven for white. Now, on the second draw, I've taken a marble out. It's in my hand. Think about it. On your second draw, you only have six marbles left inside of your box. So on the second draw, if I got red on the first one, I can draw a second red. I can now draw white or I can draw blue if I have a red one first. Now look at the probabilities here. Notice I had four reds to begin with. We're assuming on the second draw that since I started with red, I have drawn a red. So now I only have three reds left to choose from, and I only have six in the box because I started out with seven, but since I have one in my hand, there's only six left, okay? There was still only one white marble, I'm assuming that I didn't choose it. Still six, there's still two blue marbles, I'm assuming I didn't choose it. All right, so same thing with the blue one, okay? So if you look at the second one, I'm assuming that I have a blue one first, so I haven't used any red, four out of six. White still one out of six, but blue is one out of six because I'm assuming that my first draw was blue, okay? Okay, now let's take a look at the last possibilities that we have. Let's say on the first one that we draw a white marble, so one out of seven. Now notice on the second draw, we don't even have the the white as a possibility because I'm assuming that I drew white on the first one and there was only one there. So my probability of getting a zero on or on the the probability of getting white on the second draw is zero because I have none left in the box. I can only get red or blue. If you wanted to, you could write this out. Red, 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 blue, red, blue, blue, red, blue, white, blue, blue, white, red, white, blue. Okay, and that would be your sample space. So just remember your second. Um, your denominator is a six because you've already pulled one out of the box. You started with seven. You have one in your hand, so you only have six left. And then there's no white one on the last draw because you always assume that you got the color that you started with. Okay, so here's our sample space if you wanted to write it out that way. Totally up to you. Okay, and here's the probabilities. All right, so think back to the tree diagram that we just drew. What's the probability that we draw a white marble out on the first draw? Okay, this is what we're going to define A. So when we talk about probabilities, often we say A, B, C, D, probability of A, probability of B. So we're going to define A, capital A, to be the event that is occurring. So when we say what is the probability that we draw a white marble, you could probably say pretty easily, okay, 1 over 7, but we'll often define the probability. So the probability of A okay, is the probability of drawing a marble out. It's the number of outcomes that correspond to A. So how many ways can we draw a white marble? That's one. Over the total number of outcomes in the sample space, there are seven marbles in our box, okay? So the probability of drawing a white marble on our first try, one, there's one of them, seven marbles in the box. And that was just this portion right here on your tree diagram. Okay, so it gets a little bit tricky um, whenever we're taking a look at multiple probabilities, all right? What is the probability that we draw a red marble on the second draw? So what are the possibilities? Let's think about this. What are the possibilities where red is on the second draw? So this is where I have highlighted here. So the three possibilities are red, red, blue, red, and white, red. Okay, what are the possibilities of red is on the second draw? To get the probabilities of 
each event occurring, we multiply across the tree diagram. We're going to go over this later. Those events are independent. That means when I draw red on the first one, it doesn't that doesn't affect what I get on the second one. But we're going to go over that a little bit later. So basically, I know kind of red, red, blue, red, white, red. So what is the probability of getting red, red, blue, red, or white, red? That's right here. So we're adding those three probabilities together because there's three times that they are occurring. So how did I get red, red? The probability of red on the first one is four out of seven. The probability of red on the second one was three out of six. Multiply those, add them to the probability of blue was two out of seven plus red is four out of six. And this is easy from the tree diagram. Tree diagrams are so helpful. <laughs> White is one out of seven, and then red on the second one is four out of six. Okay, you can plug it in your calculator and get four out of seven. Or you can think about it this way. Never mind, you can't. <laughs> That's the only way to do it. All right, so what probability models allow us to do is they allow us to find the probability of any collection of outcomes. So in probability, we're gonna be talking about an event. An event is any collection of outcomes from some chance process. That is, an event is a subset of the sample space. So events are usually defined, like I said in the previous question, like A, B, and C. So the probability of getting white on the first try, that would be A. If A is any event, we write P of A, and that just means find the probability of A occurring. So let's just take the dice rolling example. Suppose we define A to be as sum is five. All right, so how many possibilities are there? There's one, two, three, four possibilities when I roll two dice and the sum is five. So there are four outcomes that result in a sum of five. Since each outcome has a probability of one out of 36, the probability of A or sum is five is four out of 36 because there's 36 possibilities and there's one, two, three, four ways I can get a sum of five. All right, let's take a look at this next one. So suppose B is the event sum is not five. What is the probability of B? So think about that whole diagram and what that means when I say that the probability that the sum is not five. Remember that when you roll two die, the sum is either going to be five or not five. Those are all of the possibilities. When I say sum is five, that's four of them. Sum is not five is going to be everything else in that probability sample space. Remember that probability is always between zero and one where one is a 100% chance of the event occurring. So getting a five or not getting a five is a 100% chance of occurring. So if I were to have the whole, all the sample space here, here's getting a five, everything else is not five. So the problem of getting five or not a five is 100%. That's definitely going to occur. We're gonna write that as the probability of A plus the probability of B is equal to one because we're saying the probability of getting a five plus the probability of not getting five is equal to one. That's 100% going to happen. Now, we're gonna call this something called a complement, which we'll talk about in a minute. So if I just sub what I know, the probability of getting a five, four out of 36, plus probability of not getting a five, I don't know, equals one, that's 100% occurring. So if I just rearrange this, and I do one minus, I would do the probability of B, move this over, one minus four out of 36, that just gives me 32 out of 36. So probability of B is one minus the probability of A, because B is that whole sample space, all of them, minus what we already know, minus that sum of getting a five. Okay, and those two are called complements. The reason they're called complements is because if you add them together, you get the entire sample space. All right, so we know that the final answer on the previous slide was 32 out of 36. You know, all math students, you might say, wait a second, that's not a simplified fraction. How do I write my answer? Decimal, fraction, simplified fraction, what? Number one, you always want to show the fractional work to get your answer. So show this 1 minus 4 out of 36. Don't ever just leave a decimal answer. So you can give the decimal, you can say 32 divided by 36 equals blank, but you have to show this portion of work right here. You don't have to reduce the fraction, why not? Um, so this is probably the only time you hear a math teacher say that, you don't have to reduce the fraction, and that's because it just makes us um, more easily be able to compare the answers at the end.